Hello and welcome to Fertility Springboard, the podcast series brought to you by Fertility Help Hub. I'm Eloise, founder of Fertility Help Hub, and over the series I will be bringing you conversations with some of the most influential and inspiring professionals and experts around the world to arm you with useful and empowering thoughts and resources to ease your fertility journey. And don't forget to sign up to the newsletter to make sure you don't miss out on anything. It's packed full of inspiring interviews, resources, discounts and offers, competitions and real life stories. Hello, welcome. Today I'm speaking with Jana Rupnow, who is a licensed professional counsellor and author of Three Makes Baby. Welcome, Jana. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. And um, donor conception is a, a big part of my life personally. So to be able to talk to a professional about it, get your thoughts and hear more about how you can help or how you do help others um, and the incredible book that you've written is great, a great resource. So thank you so much for coming today. Please could you start by just uh, giving yourself an introduction and telling people a little bit about your personal fertility journey before we talk about how you can help people. Absolutely. So like you mentioned, thank you for the introduction. For those that are listening, I am based in the United States. um, And so I've been practicing here for 10 years in the field of fertility. I started practicing in this field because I was personally impacted by infertility. Um, This has been 15 years ago or more now, so that dates me. Um, But this was before social media, and it was really a very isolating time and a lonely time. And I didn't have many people to talk to about infertility. And I remember just how, um, you know, how profoundly it impacted my life, you know. And so we had, my husband and I had secondary infertility. We were able to conceive our biological son within five months, which still felt like a long time. And I would soon find out why Um, it took a little longer, which, you know, I still know can be normal. But then we could not conceive a second child. So we kind of went to a fertility doctor and they told us what was going on. We found it was male factor infertility and that it was going to be really difficult to get pregnant without um, a lot of intervention, without a lot of treatment. Um, We kind of sat on that and decided let's pursue adoption. Adoption was something we were always interested in. Um, I was adopted as a baby with my twin brother Uh, six weeks. So it was something that we were familiar with and comfortable with. And, um, you know, we never were able to get pregnant a second time until 14 years later. So by this time it was 2014 and it was a complete accident. I did end up miscarrying that baby at eight weeks. And so then, you know, all this time I had been counseling uh, couples and individuals on miscarriage and grief. And then I experienced one myself. So that was it was really eye opening for me, and I really helped me to identify even more with my with my clients, but also to give them hope because to get pregnant after so many years, you know, even though it wasn't viable, was still a message of hope for me, and that I wanted to be able to share with others. So, did you ever have fertility treatment yourself? So, I did a lot of the initial diagnostics, and what we found out was that we were going to require ICSI. And I was at the time, and you have to understand this was like 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I hadn't even heard of this before. So I was, we were hesitant to do ICSI um, because we just didn't know anything about it. Didn't have anybody to talk to, had no clue. And because we were more familiar with adoption, me being adopted, it just seemed for us more comfortable. But, you know, again, that's so much, that's such an individual experience um, is why we were more comfortable with the um, with adoption versus trying fertility treatments. I personally was uh, concerned about the just the hormones and things for myself, just because I've never been a person who responded well to hormones, you know, like birth control and things like that. So it was kind of just an individual health choice at the time. And also just the unknowns, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. There's unknowns with adoption too. So, you know, sort of like what unknown are you the most comfortable with? Um, for us, it was, we were a little more comfortable with adoption, but it was still terrifying, to be honest. You know, it was, it was terrifying. Can you tell us a little bit about the adoption process? Of course. Um, so we adopted from China. It was a two-year process. 
Um, we had to go through, you know, the dossier, the background checks, the, you know, the waiting, um, we travel to China and we were there for only um, 16 days and they literally handed us our daughter the second day we were there. We were still jet lagged. Um, you know, it was, we didn't know what baby we were going to get. We were matched by the Chinese government um, and their process was a mystery. So, you know, I spent a lot of time dreaming and wondering about what my baby was going to look like and who she was going to be. Um, but ultimately I had no control over that. We received a picture from the Chinese government when we were matched. And at that point she was older. A lot of babies were, you know, about a year or under and our daughter was 16 months and she was in, they told us she was in foster care, which was very, very unusual in China. She had some health measurements on her paperwork that didn't look good. Um, we had to do a lot of guesswork. We had to, you know, consult with an, I remember consulting with an expert in Seattle and finding out, you know, does our child possibly have brain damage? You know, I mean, it was that scary. So, you know, it all turned out okay, but there's a lot of risks and leaps of faith that you take along the way. So Wow. It's like the journey never ends, isn't it? Just yeah, it's to true. Complete yeah. your family. You just have to go, or so many people have to go, as people listening will know, through so many hurdles to get there sometimes. Mm -hmm. What an inspiring end to the story. It was. And a lot of people that see the story now and everything, you know, we've done, you know, a lot of work over the years just to be a healthy family, but that the story we only show the, the sort of the highlights and the positives. And I think it's so important to share those darker, more difficult, more challenging moments. So people know that they're not alone and it's so real. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not the most fun thing to hear about when you're, you know, scrolling social media is, but it, it does make people feel um, like they are in this and there's other people out there that can help them through it. Um, walk that have walked the path before. If I can be a voice for someone else where they don't feel that way, then hey, that's why not? Why not do that and use my story in a way that's powerful for others? That's all we can really do. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that, as you said, things are getting better now, and there's such a great Instagram community, and people are coming together to really talk about how they truly are thinking and feeling and. Um, you know, there is still room to grow, but I think that mental health is becoming more vocalized and people are mm. starting to understand it more, which is great. Um, yeah. But of course, there is still more work to be done to bring fertility issues into mainstream life so that people who aren't affected by it understand what or, or can sort of empathize with the struggles, the real struggles that people go through that they may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, it's true. And we, we, some, we tend to boil everything down to a soundbite um, once we've been through it. And, but what we cannot underestimate is the, like you mentioned, you said, the, the journey, the length, the trials and tribulations along the way, the, the things that, you know, maybe you look back and they seem like just a little moment, but they were so difficult at the time to manage and so stressful. You know, you're losing sleep over it. And, um, you know, we just can't gloss over that because that's what people are in the middle of. You know, they're in the trenches, so to speak, when they're in, going through infertility. Absolutely. So what inspired you to write about donor conception and write uh, Three Makes Baby in 2008? Yeah. yeah. So what was so interesting at the time, so I was doing adoption counseling and, you know, what I found with adoption counseling was, um, and is that there, there's a tremendous amount of focus on trauma and loss and grief. And that's important because so many years that was ignored. But what I, what I found was like, I didn't find the messages of hope and healing and of how families can heal and grow and be healthy. So I, you know, wasn't working for an agency. A lot of adoption agencies um, are in place. So, you know, kind of, I was on my own. I was independent. And I'm, when I was seeing my fertility doctor, he said to me, he's like, have you thought of doing third-party reproductive counseling? And I said, no, you know, tell me more. And so he was sharing me, you know, with it. He was sharing that with me. And he, of course, is a fertility doctor. So he's doing procedures. And he also adopted a son. So he is older than me. Um, and, and I think they didn't pursue fertility treatments just because they weren't there yet either, you know, but he said, go ahead, you know, give this a try. So I joined the ASRM and I began 
realizing that there was a lot of overlap in the psychological and emotional and social topics that when couples would come to see me to talk about donor conception, it reminded me so much of the journey we went through um, when we were adopting. And so I started kind of teasing out the differences and the similarities and just continued having doctors refer their patients to me and, you know, began to grow an expertise in this area using my knowledge um, and then also understanding the differences and being very sympathetic and, you know, kind of taking each case as an individual case. So over the years, I saw the same five concerns come up over and over with parents that were using a donor. And I decided I've got to organize this for them because then when they came in, they were so confused. Like, I, you know what? We, we don't know. We just were so scared to do this, but we don't know why. And I remember like, well, you know, let me help them sort this out. So that was the book, the conception of the book. And really I was like, I've got to get this down on paper so people can take this home with them and have a resource. We didn't have enough time in one session to cover all of this information that the, really the families needed long-term because this was, this is a decision that impacts the rest of your life. So you need help. You know, if a challenge comes up when your child is seven or 12, where can you turn to? So that's what I really wanted to focus on. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And let me guess that um, some of the or anxieties or concerns that have come up are things like, will I love the child? Will the child love me? Will the child mm -hmm. resent us for this decision? How do we tell the child? Do we tell the child? Are those the kind of things that you see? Yes, absolutely. And it's similar feelings that people that I counseled that were adopting children felt as well. So I was real familiar with the um, psychological, emotional feelings of raising a non-biological child and the dynamics that it, that introduces to a family long-term, you know? So yeah. And just things like even, are we going to feel different from other families? How do we cope with explaining um, to our doctor or to family extended family members that we had to use a donor? Do we tell them the truth about our child? Um, are they going to love our child the same if they know they're not, you know, blood, a blood relative, so yeah, all those kinds of concerns came up a lot. I think because I'm um, sort of, I'm in that journey as we speak, three and a half years into it now. Um, and as you, as I know that you write about in the book, a lot of these things kind of um, happen or the, the anxieties you have preconception may disappear as you um, live, live the family life. Um, and I think that one of the things that you mention, which I've experienced is I mean we chose we decided to be open from the beginning so telling our children not that they complete they aren't they're too young to understand at the moment but our elder two three and a half is starting to use the word donor um it's kind of like what what's the language we use and we obviously because I'm working in this space it's become very public and a lot of our friends follow what I'm doing which is great especially for education around it However, it's got to the stage where, where we were quite shielded about it at the beginning, but that's gone from being like that to saying, hey, we're really proud of how we made our family and there's nothing to be shame, you know, there's nothing shameful about it. Mm -hmm. um, but even though we are very open about it, it's got to the stage where I can't remember who knows what and um, if our extended family do know. So now that the children are getting older, it gets to the point where it's kind of like, do I need to say something? Because I'm not sure who knows and doesn't know. Obviously, family know, but I'm talking about great aunts and uncles and, you know, things like that, people like that, where there wasn't like a time where we sat down and said, this is what we were doing because it happened so quickly. Um, and mm -hmm. it's just never really come up. But of course, it will come up because the children will encourage to talk about it as and when they want. That's when I treat it as, a you know, you would any other piece of information that's really relevant, but not something that you have to lead with, you know, if in conversation, you trust that just like other pieces of information that are shared between family members, that this will either be known or unknown. And if it comes up in conversation or is unknown, you find out, you know, say you're having a conversation with a great aunt and somehow it comes out and she didn't know you say, Oh, I thought you knew. I'm exactly, you know, we're, we're pretty open about it. So no, yeah, absolutely. This is how we did it. And this is how we conceived. And then you, you still convey that attitude of openness. So, you know, there's no have to um, about it. I think that assuming people know is a really liberating feeling. 
because then you just go, because that shows a great deal of acceptance inside yourself that you assume. And if they don't, well then, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm pleased and happy and to inform you at this point. And yeah, it, I, you didn't catch wind. Okay. Well, here it is now. So that's kind of the way I approach it. And what would you say are the similarities and the differences between adoption and uh, third party uh, donation? So with third party donation, you've got one parent who is related to, and I say that, but that's actually not always true. Let me back up for a second. With egg and sperm donation, you have one parent who is related to the child. So you've got more of a genetic uh, connection there to the family. You've got a family tree that they're connected to on at least half. Now with embryo adoption or embryo donation, that is more similar to traditional adoption with the biggest difference being that you carry the baby in utero. And that we know how important those nine months are. I mean, more and more research is showing us just the profound effects lifelong on an individual. And so when you have that control and that ability to have a healthy, happy, stress-free pregnancy, that can really help a lot. You know, we have, if in adoption, it depends on the circumstance, but you might have some more traumatic situations, you know, with a traditional adoption um, where there's a lot of stress involved. If a, if a mother has to give a baby away, there could be more stress involved. Or it could be more of a very deliberate and um, peaceful placement as well. So again, we don't want to generalize adoption as always traumatic because then it kind of makes that seem like it's, you know, adoptees are troubled and, and those aren't. So, and that's not necessarily the case because we have more, more and more open adoption. But you still, like I said, in general, you have more control of that pregnancy. And then the bonding can be easier too because as you're carrying the baby, we release chemicals on in our brain that help us to bond with our baby. So the bonding process may be a little quicker with adoption. Sometimes, you know, you get handed a baby, it takes time to bond with that baby. And what do you think in terms of the way that the child perceives the parents? Yeah, this is going to be so individual. And I say this a lot because what we found through research is it really is dependent on the personality of the child. We have such unique ways we think and um, inner relate. And then also you have to look at the dynamic of family dynamic relationship and the attachment process. And if there's any dysfunction or if there's any, you know, break in attachment. And so it's so varied. It's too hard to say, you know, there is one way that a child would feel differently or the same. That's why I, I have my podcasts to show a lot of different stories and different reactions. So you can see the wide variety of experiences. Um, like I said, having that one parent with donor, with egg donor or sperm donation, having that one parent that they can have like guideposts and, and um, genetic cues and what might I look like or be like when I'm older, that can help them maybe have a sense of a bit more groundedness. But let's say you have an open adoption experience where they know both birth parents and they have a relationship to some extent, but that could be very, look very different and feel more grounding than a donor conceived individual who's does is anonymous, doesn't know, you know, their uh, sperm donor, or maybe found out later in life and has some some betrayal issues around that. So again, so varied. It, you know, I, I, I wish I could give you a more <laughs> like complete answer, and maybe research someday will show us, you know, and give us some more um, concrete differences and distinct distinctions. We're just guessing at this point. Absolutely, and I guess also it probably, as you said, it depends on the individual child. Like I always think with my three children, they might all have different views about it, and it's so impossible to know what those are going to be when they're young. Yeah, and allowing them to have those differences and to feel differently, not be like you know one brother or sister says, "Why do you? What is your deal? Why do you care so much? What's what's wrong with you?" Where when maybe you know one of them doesn't care at all. Yeah, I have a twin brother. He's not interested really at all in our birth family. So, and I actually searched. So it's just, yeah, it's just respecting those differences and everything's okay. I always say that, you know, like whatever you feel is what you feel and that's okay. And I think that's a fascinating point. You saying that you researched. Now, I guess for people who are considering adoption or donor conception, there can be that fear of what if the child, what if I raise a child and then they don't, you know, they look for the, their natural birth parent or mm -hmm. genetics feeling replaced now would you say that your desire to search was um not to replace parents that raised you yeah. but more out yeah. of curiosity yes for me personally it was a curiosity of 
where do I get some of the traits that are uniquely me? Is that genetics? Is that from my, my parents who raised me and my environment? Or is it something, some third unknown? I think it just, again, depends on how much you have to understand. I'm a therapist. I do a lot of self-work. So for me, naturally, I really wanted to understand those pieces. Um, for my brother, he's in a different industry. He's in, you know, GIS, not as, you know, therapy minded, maybe not as relevant to him. It just depends on the person. So that's what, for me, that's what it was. Not a replacement in any sense. I don't have a, that type of, I only have like an acquaintance, barely know my birth parents. Um, and they could never replace that, those years of attachment and memories and, you know, shared experiences that I have with my family. Um, that's just something we get together at Christmas and we all have our funny jokes and inside jokes and traditions and you just can't make up for that time, you know? No, no, that's very reassuring to hear. Thank you for sharing. And the last thing mm. I wanted to ask you before we have to end is when, if, if people are thinking about donor conception and they're starting the journey or their parents um, to donor conceived children, what would be your takeaway tips and thoughts and considerations for anyone going down that route or who's gone down that route? I think, first of all, don't be afraid of your feelings <laughs> uh, and know that you, it's going to be confusing. I think the, the term that comes up the most frequently is confusion and we call it genetic bewilderment. And that is very ring that both parents and children can experience when they're dealing with having a family that's not genetically related. So dive into that and sort it out. Get some help from a professional if you need to, because that is going to make you a healthy family in the long term. That's going to help you to know what is your issue and not to project that in, onto your child. And, or to, or, and also it helps us as parents manage our expectations expectations of parenting, of our role as a parent, and allow us to allow our children to be who they are. You know, so that's the biggest piece is not expecting our kids to be that extension of ourselves or to be a little mini me, you know, but letting them be who they are. I mean, that's the biggest piece of advice I can give for parenting in general, you know, but mm -hmm. especially it's relevant with donor conception as you're going down this journey. What about when selecting a donor? So selecting a donor is, you know, you've probably heard me say it's, I, I say bonding over blending and it's not that blending, there's anything wrong with that. I know we, sometimes you're looking for your doppelganger, someone who's going to be a replacement for you, but remember you can't do that. You can't find someone who's going to replace you. You're just as unique as a, as a person. And so you're going to find somebody that you can bond with, that you like, that you have a positive regard toward. And so, because then when you see those same similarities or you, maybe some unknown traits come up in your child and you wonder that if it's the donor, that you can feel positive feelings feelings toward that, those traits, and that you can also feel a connection with your child. So that becomes more important. So some people say, I can't find someone who looks like me. So, well, but you can find somebody that, that likes the same things you like, or, you know, has similar traits that aren't physical. Absolutely. And what about, that's great advice. And I totally resonate with that, those thought, that thought process, when having selected myself with donor sperm. Um, and what about, this is a huge one to open just as we're ending, but considerations for people who haven't maybe thought about whether to pick someone who's anonymous or uh, open. Yeah. So there's so many choices there and so remember things are going to change. So whatever is today, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years, and we're going to be, it's going to be very different. I always say lean towards openness. And what that means is I know there's circumstances where it's very difficult to choose someone who's open ID, but knowing that over time you have the ability to open if you want, that gives you more access to information and more ways to just to seek out and find a donor should you want to or should your child want to um, at a moment in time, whether that's, again, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, um, that can be you know, helpful. So if you have someone who's, who's absolutely closed, also remember that's how they feel now, or maybe that's the information you're receiving now. That doesn't mean that's how they're going to feel in 10, 20 years either. So whatever it is, anonymous or known because of your situation, let that be flexible in your mind because that does not stay static. 
And I think that's what people make that mistake. And I, I meet with people 10 years down the road and they say, well, my donor is closed. And I say, well, are you sure? Do you still know? You know, people, donors out there, they see programs, they read information, they have empathy and compassion. And they think, oh, you know, this, I never thought that much. This child might want to reach out and know more about uh, his or her genetics. So, you know, I would be willing to be open and just give them some information. So just keep that in mind. And as you said, you know, ancestry and tracking people, that kind of thing's changing. And as you said, the donor might change their circumstances. They meet, might meet someone else who has a different view on yes. their decision when they were donating. So it is, it's always going to be a movable feast, isn't it? It's such a move, such a movable, um, you know, moving parts. And just to be, if you have that flexibility and adaptability, and as you approach this, that's just going to serve you the best because you'll just be able to move with it wherever it goes. Absolutely. So. Thank you. And for anyone who's listening, yeah. you should definitely, definitely check out Jana's amazing book, which, um, I mean, me personally uh, found very fascinating to read. And it's called Three Makes Baby from uh, 2018. And okay. the link is here in the bio. So thank you so yeah. much, Jana. And it's on Amazon. And you can also get the workbook, companion workbook, as a guide that helps you prepare emotionally. That's on Amazon too. So yeah, thank you for cool. having me. And your podcast as well. That's right. Same, same name. Three makes baby. Perfect. Perfect. Check it out. Thanks so much, Jana. Lovely to speak. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>